All right. Hello. Welcome back, everybody. My name is Ben Fellows. Today I am joined by Mol Michael, excuse me, Bolton. Uh, Michael is the lead consultant of DevelopSense and has a, a couple of different websites, developsense.com, rapidsoftware.com, or rapidsoftwaretesting.com, excuse me. Michael, thanks for joining me. Thanks. Nice um, to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you as well. It's it's been really. Uh, we were already just talking about a couple of different topics before this call that I found really interesting. So, but just to to set the stage, can you walk me through kind of how QA has played a role in your career? Kind of how you were first exposed to QA? How your perspective of QA has developed as as your career has gone along? Uh, before I do that, can you help me understand what you mean by QA? That's a fair point. Um, Let's see here, because there's a lot of, that's a very nuanced, large question, and actually one that I feel like I should have a better definition to. Let's assume that for the sake of this conversation, um, processes, systems, and techniques for helping to ship quality software, but I'm curious by, like, what are the different definitions of quality assurance and software testing that you bring to the table? Because I do think that that's an interesting spot to start in this conversation. Well, that's the first time, I think, since we started talking, including the time before, that you've mentioned testing. And this is a big problem for me, in that many people seem to conflate these two things and don't really untangle the differences between them in the same kind of way that uh, uh, people think, oh, forests, uh, that's just moss, right? Yeah. <laughs> moss is part of a forest, but it's not a forest. Trees are part of forests, but they're not forests. Um, I will tell you what I mean by testing, and then uh, we can proceed from there, I suppose. Uh, for me and for my colleague James Bach and for other uh, members of the rapid software testing community and the large and the small, testing is evaluating a product by learning about it through experiencing, exploring, and experimenting. Now, that on its own includes a lot of stuff. That includes studying the product, modeling the product, modeling the test space, modeling risk. Uh, it includes uh, uh, examining the product, interacting with it, manipulating it, observing it. It includes generating ideas about how to test it, developing strategies, expanding on the ideas that we've generated, refining ideas that we've expanded on, uh, overproducing ideas, abandoning ideas that we've overproduced, recovering ideas that we've abandoned. It includes critical thinking. It includes navigating through the product. It includes map making. It includes collaboration with other people. It includes analyzing risk and doing all this in a, a, a cyclic, uh, fractal kind of way. Um, that is, uh, we look at the big stuff and we look at the little stuff. We zoom in, we zoom out. So alternation is another dynamic that happens in testing. The reason this bugs me, this uh, uh, absence of the, the clarity of the way people talk about this stuff, is that testing does not and cannot assure quality. Testing can't do that any more than uh, uh, weighing yourself can uh, assure that your health improves. Uh, no more than uh, uh, journalism, investigative journalism, uh, makes a society better. Whatever testing we do isn't going to change the product. In testing, we're not worried about quality. We're not worried about improving the product. That's a different deal. Testing is about finding truths about the product, finding the true status of the product so that the people who do assure quality can do so in an informed way, knowing about what's actually going on in the product. So there's that. Uh, now, you also asked uh, about quality assurance. Here's what I think we can look at uh, uh, 
uh, here's a way we can look at what quality assurance is all about. First of all, on the level of the individual member of the team, the individual contributor to the, the building and development or design uh, of the product in various different dimensions of the product itself, of course. From the perspective of the individual, we can look at it and say, well, I'm, I'm, I can assure the quality of my work uh, to, uh, uh, to other people. I, I can provide a warrant for my work and what I believe to be important about it and, and why uh, I consider it to be good work. There's another dimension of quality assurance, which is on the management level. Somebody who has the authority to make decisions about where money is spent, how time is spent, about the release of the product, that person has uh, responsibility in the, the role of quality assurance in the, in the larger sense. They set the conditions by which quality can be assured. And they are uh, responsible for making sure that it's so. Testing informs that. But testing is not that. And uh, yeah. this is an idea that, that really came to me about 26 years ago in a, a class taught by Kim Kaner, uh, in which he, he made this essential point. And uh, I've been struggling to uh, get that message across to other people ever since. The real quality assurance role in an organization is management. You uh, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you talk to uh, CTOs and uh, uh, CXOs of various kinds. It's important for them to understand that quality assurance is their responsibility, and the quality assurance is not something you uh, uh, hand off to uh, to testers, thinking that testers are going to change the status of the product. Testers are a form of extrasensory perception for the CTO. It, it, I don't mean, you know, that, that kind of uh, thing. What I mean is their extra sensory perception. Testing extends the senses of the product. Uh, we get our hands, our fingertips on the product. We get our eyes on the product and our ears on it so that we can experience it and help other people understand what that's like. Yeah, that's really remarkable, right? Because I think that flippantly using the terminology, oh, I'm hiring a, a QA person, or flippantly using quality assurance as this person's job, over time, and it seems like you agree with this point, has somehow placed the responsibility of, oh, a bug made it into production, or why didn't this get caught? on the shoulders of this QA person when they're well, a that's software not responsibility, tester. that's blame. <laughs> blame, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. a really also interesting point, which is fun. I mean, the immediate aspect of this conversation is now I'm like starting to even think about my own terminology and just like, okay, right there, responsibility or blame. So um, that's really remarkable. Thank you. And so you said you started this with a class and that kind of opened your eyes and you took a class. I mean, how has this evolved over time for you and you said obviously you're trying to change some of this i mean walk me through you took that class your eyes were kind of open to this and then and what have you done sort of on the path trying to to make uh, impact society on this way because I, I, now i'm starting to i think what you're happening what you're watching me verbally do is start to rethink a lot of my own paradigms and now i'm getting caught up in some of those conversations in my own head as opposed to just asking you the questions that i probably should be asking you uh, well, I, I, I don't mind, I understand, because uh, a, a lot of people have that moment of uh, their minds being blown um, when uh, uh, this sort of stuff comes up. And, and I mean, uh, it's kind of fun to foster that. So I, I get a, a little bit of uh, uh, endorphin rush myself from, uh, from that moment. Um, but... It, in terms of, of understanding that distinction, uh, the evolution came, you know, reasonably slowly. I started writing code in 1988 or so. I was working at a, 
a headhunter is basically a personnel agency. Um, and first thing that happened was I, I took the job that I had, which was a, essentially a data entry clerk, and I started applying tools to that job. Um, first thing I, I got was a, a there was an off-the-shelf uh, macro processor that allowed me to enter data faster, uh, or that allowed me to, to uh, do uh, repetitive things at automatically touch of a button. And that was kind of cool, because this was a, almost a kind of meta computing in, in, uh, in my mind back then. I can use a computer to help me do stuff on the computer. Then I realized that the database software that this organization had was in some respects uh, uh, wanting. The uh, developer had designed it, great developer as far as I can tell. I, I never found any um, uh, errors in the code that could be traced to, to uh, any sense of incompetence on the part of the programmer. Sometimes we would run into a printer that wouldn't uh, uh, handle the stuff properly. Sometimes we would run into uh, cases where people wanted more information than was available by querying the database. Well, I couldn't do anything about the first thing, but with the second thing, I had been a hobbyist and I had uh, my trusty copy of DBase 3 Plus, uh, which I probably, had, now that I think of it, was uh, uh, not legal to bring in. But I started using that to build software to query the underlying database. The, the, the tables and so on and so forth. And in doing that, boom, I suddenly became a software developer. Uh, you start being a software developer as soon as you start developing software. And as a consequence of that, I immediately became a tester as well because if you're going to build anything, you are going to need to decide whether what you built is what you intended to build or whether there are uh, things wanting. Another thing that happens, by the way, in testing is you find out that your intentions were met, but your intentions really weren't good enough to solve, help solve problems for other people. So that, that's two dimensions of, uh, of what testing helps us to understand. One is, are there problems in the product? Another is, uh, are there problems left unsolved by our attempt to solve the problem? And the third thing is, uh, I suppose, uh, have we introduced new problems on the way to solving the uh, initial uh, list of problems that we intended to solve? Okay. So that uh, uh, went along for a little while. Um, I built and documented that uh, library of stuff that would provide a kind of add-on to the database software that the agency had. Uh, in there, I started uh, assisting with uh, network management at this place, very small organization. There's another fellow who is uh, responsible for uh, installing and managing the network. Bear in mind, this is 1988 still, so this is quite a while ago. Um, then I found that um, there was a problem. The network software had a hard time coexisting with other software that people uh, wanted to run because the network software took up space and space was very limited in those days. So it took up uh, a memory. Had to be running all the time, took up space in the, the amount of memory available with the computers. So I started working with a memory manager, um, found it confusing and, and uh, a troublesome, got on the phone uh, to the tech support people there and then my manager came in and said, you know, I, I understand you're, you're kind of chafing at the bit in this job. That memory management company has a job ad. They're opening a Toronto office. Would you be interested in that? He's a great guy. He eventually worked for, started working for the company as well. I recruited him uh, after that. But I got a job as a tech support person with that company. And then I became a tester in a whole different way because customers were calling in with uh, a essentially problems that they were experiencing with our software, but problems they were experiencing with their own software that our software helped them to reveal. Our software put the processor into, into a different mode in which certain things you could get away with ordinarily in a, a, a 
software package, uh, you couldn't get away with them because the, the processor's protection features were turned on. So they would call up and they would say, we, I just installed your product and now my software doesn't work. Uh, our reply to that would be, we'll try with any other memory manager that puts the processor in the same mode and you're going to run into the same problem here and there. So. Uh, but sorting that out, getting to the bottom of that, required us to test and to uh, study a product that we had not built and uh, study its interaction with our product. So that, that was a form of compatibility testing, really. Uh, of course, occasionally customers would report problems with usability on our product. And there we would have to drop what we knew about our stuff and put ourselves in the position of somebody who is encountering this product and trying to learn how to use it. And so all of a sudden, even though our job nominally was customer support, we were doing usability testing. Yeah. Um, when uh, uh, somebody said, the product is supposed to be able to do this uh, uh, thing and, and we're struggling to figure out how to do it, sometimes we would discover that the product, our product didn't do the thing that was advertised or documented that uh, it should do. Therefore, we were doing capability testing at that point. So although our jobs were not uh, uh, denominated as tester. That's what we were doing uh, uh, to a significant degree. And the company had no dedicated testers. Yeah, uh, it, it, they, We had developers and we had technical support people who would test the product uh, quickly and fairly aggressively, but we uh, didn't have a department called testing. We didn't have people with the, the designation tester. Well, about a year or two after I joined the company, that changed, and one of the uh, more pragmatic people in the, the department became the first test manager at that company. Um, and I went along in tech support for a few years uh, in the Canadian office. Well, the head office was in Santa Monica, California. And in 1994, he recruited me to work on this uh, very high priority product for the company um, that was moving into a kind of release mode after a couple of years of development. And I got my first job titled tester. Uh, and in that job, my, my work was to test the product, but also to keep track of the testing and the, the bug reports that other people had done, uh, had uh, provided, and to sort those out. First job called tester, uh, six years after getting into software development and, and associated tasks. And that paradigm still holds true today, actually. I mean, in many ways, right? You have your customer success who are testing and they don't realize that they're testing, oftentimes. You have oftentimes in small startups, people who are in customer success who are dropped into kind of testing roles and being like, well, you know our product well, so so test it. And um, it, it's real. I mean, you can see so many parallels. So what... There are just two things I want to Go mention. That, yeah. that, that, uh, um, one of them is uh, the idea that uh, that's a great way to go, it seems to me, in your evolution as a tester. Great idea. And yet organizations all over the place are torpedoing that by, among other things, getting rid of their technical support departments or cutting them down to the barest bones, um, replacing testers with chatbots, or, or customer support people, rather, with uh, chatbots, um, cutting off the primary source of information, the most one of the most direct sources of information that the organization can have, which is people talking to people about the product and about problems in it. And I, 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 it, you know, it, it's been a, eh, over 30 years I've been in this business, and that pattern is driving me bananas. It was starting back in, um, uh, even in the time when I was working as a, a support person, they were always saying, well, how can we, the crazy thing, how can we make customer support a, co uh, a, um, a profit center instead of a cost center? Ugh. <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> it, you make it a profit center by listening to your customer support people. That's it. I mean, it, you don't make profit out of that, but you sure get information that can help. Well, you, you iterate faster, you get feedback, you get rid of, yeah. Feedback is a key word, right. Absolutely. Um, the other thing, though, that you, uh, you stepped on yet another landmine, which is uh, this way we have of trying to use magic words in this business. It, it uh, again, that drives me bananas. Customer success. When does somebody call the customer success department when they're not having success? <laughs> Um, um, uh, we 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 refer to it as a you know customer success in a way to paint over the bad feelings we might have about the fact that customers need support with our products. I, and that uh, uh, it, it, it's not a none of this is unique uh, to that term or to, to to yourself or anything like that. But it it, it is this trend of of, um, euphemism and and doublespeak that we're using in in this business. And it, it, I was fascinated by George Orwell when I was 15 years old and first started to run into his books. Why is it that we have such a hard time saying it? No. (laughs) Do you think this is all just like innocent in some way or is it? Is there? I would imagine there's intentionality here, right? Customer success is they're trying to rebrand this role from something that's... But I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with saying customer service. So Customer service is fantastic. That would be a great term for it. So I where along... Where, and I People probably could Google that. this, but where along the route, where along the road did we go from we hiring for customer service to customer success? Is it because... It was a more attractive sounding job, essentially. Is that what sort of? I I think it's this 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 tendency that that humans have generally to to try to use paint to cover up problems or to try to use wallpaper to cover up problems. Um, and this is not a new thing, even in software. Um, my great mentor Jerry Weinberg, many people who. Uh, uh, share that uh, uh, relationship with him. Jerry was a, a giant in the field of software development and, and testing. To my view, far too few people know about um, his uh, his work. But in 1961, he wrote his first book on software development, and he wrote the first chapter about testing that is consistent with our notion of of testing in in rapid software testing. And uh, it was a a chapter on errors. It was a chapter on mistakes. And I interviewed him one time. I think you can find an account of that interview on my uh, my blog. In 2008, I interviewed him. And he said, uh, well, I wrote that chapter 47 years ago. Um, He said... uh, uh, when I wrote a chapter about errors, people asked me, why would you, it, you're, you're supposed to be focusing on the positive in software development. Why would you write a chapter on errors? And he said, the reaction I got, and he literally said this to me, the reaction I got was if I had suddenly started discussing human excrement. <laughs> and he said, almost 50 years after that book was written, we still have problems in software development and the prudes are still with us. <laughs> We've got to become comfortable about talking about problems, about uh, errors, and I, I, I'm so excited by the fact that you mentioned customer service. That is a wonderful way of expressing it. We're here to serve people. Now, in that sense, I suppose all developers are customer service uh, uh, people in one sense, or uh, managers and so on. We're all in the customer service business. The direct version of customer service getting uh, a cut is something that alarms me tremendously because not only are you cutting off that source of information, but you're cutting off uh, an important farm team for potential testers and for responsible developers who, uh, uh, by experience with customer service, get to recognize that, hey, we're doing this for people. It's not just an abstraction. So a quarter deck, uh, a customer service was an important um, uh, launching pad for several different kinds of careers. Tester, 
developer, and in my case, program manager. Uh, I, so that was my next uh, uh, foray, or my next step along the path into uh, uh, that kind of quality assurance. At that, in that role, I could assure quality fairly substantially. So uh, uh, along this, right, um, moving up the ladder, in the modern day head of engineering CTO, where do they, like, why so often do you feel like they're not sort of head of quality assurance, right? Because it's, I think they think they are in many ways, but they're, I think maybe that sometimes, honestly, it's just an unknown field. Like, I, I, I sometimes I'll talk to CTOs and they just genuinely don't know that much about QA, but I'm curious to know from your perspective, where, where is that gap or is there a gap or is, is there a different way of sort of highlighting how organizations don't necessarily view to your point QA as the forest that all, everything happens in, as opposed to just software testing. I'm, I'm curious I, to your perspective. I, that's a big tangle ball of string. Uh, from, well, you from have my like you have about ten minutes to solve it all for us all. So. Oh, great. Okay. Well. <laughs> uh, uh, no, sorry. Continue. Got to leave that. No, no. Uh, uh, no worries. Um, one thing that as a contributor to this is that many people who get promoted to those places um, are promoted there because they have expertise in software development and not necessarily in uh, managing people. Uh, they get exposed to managing people on the way up, but they don't uh, receive uh, a formal training in it. Uh, they're enculturated. They, they, they learn through immersion. And, of course, if the society, the, the social group, the organization in which they're embedded is, I'll use this uh, term, it's a little harsh, but if it is a, a, a decadent or primitive or um, uh, not thought through, uh, not analyzed, not studied very well, uh, then the process is going to continue. It's going to repeat. We're going to create a culture that's based on the culture that we came from. And in order for that to change, we would need people who are being promoted to, to development management roles and, and uh, CTO roles to get something extra, something that they're not going to get from simply doing it the way that we've always done it here. Um, and that is... Uh, exposure to not just being a manager but to analyzing what management is all about and I don't think that happens very often uh, sometimes in really well functioning organizations we will have a, a management that um, uh, uh, puts on the on the agenda the idea of feedback and, and retrospection looking on what has happened um, and and trying to uh, understand the, the forces at work and on the evolution of the, the product and the project. Much of that, again through habit, through, through folklore, through immersion, uh, focuses on the technological aspects of what's gone on. But software development is an intensely social activity. Uh, it's people if done right. working to solve problems for people. Well, no, it's always social. Oh, always interesting. Always social. Okay. Uh, we recognize the social nature of it when we bother to think about it. That's the done right part. Fair. When we notice it and when we consider it. But it's always a social activity. Um, the social dimensions of it very often get swept under the rug. Um, or, or that the rug is never lifted to reveal what's happening underneath, under the under the floorboards there, and of course, since I'm uh, uh, going to, since I'm using a metaphor there, I'll, I'll take it one step further, because a, ru a rug isn't uh, pulled up, and because the floorboards aren't revealed, and because the uh, holes in the floorboards aren't revealed, we don't see the bugs that are living underneath in the uh, in the floorboards and in the walls. Now, that's what happens when we use paint and wallpaper and, and carpets and stuff. We we hide stuff that might be there, might be worth noticing if there are 
weaknesses in the um, in the product. I'm looking around. I'm in a a, a, a B and B at the moment. I, we're, my wife and I are visiting my daughter. And look at all this wallpaper in this fairly elderly building. I, I suspect it was built in the 1870s or 1880s or something like that. And my mind is going to. I wonder if there are cracks underneath that wallpaper. <laughs> Uh, and that, that what software uh, is like. Software has a lot of wallpaper over the deeper, hidden, structural elements of it. Yes. Yeah. Um, Michael, just a couple things. One is we're at the half an hour mark, and I'm trying to keep these conversations roughly, roughly at that half an hour. On the other hand, I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface of, of your insights and knowledge. And... Um, enjoying the landmines that I'm walking on because each time I accidentally <laughs> walk on a landmine, I feel like I have a new way of reframing a lot of paradigms that I have sort of accidentally fallen into. Um, for the sake of this conversation and today and, and trying to keep this at this mark, um, I'm going to ask, like, once again, we didn't even get into software testing because I think we spent the whole time just trying to even deal with my own, let's call it naivety or sometimes even ignorance about sort of even my own language. Um, what would be a way of wrapping up? Let's focus on just terminology and framing and thinking about how we've gotten away from that for this conversation that people could take away from your insights on it. Boy, oh boy. Um, that's almost... Once this, again, uh, very large. Sorry. There, there's, yeah, there's another half hour for you right there. Here's what I might uh, <laughs> offer, though, as, uh, as an idea. Everybody in the project, just about, is focused on success. Everybody in the project is focused on envisioning success. We're trying to build a product. The process of software development is really all about trying to make trouble go away. That's the developer's mindset. That's the designer's mindset. That's mostly the manager's mindset, too, I think. We're trying to help... Uh, people's troubles go away. That benefits from a critical stance. That's what makes testers different from everybody else on the project in our way of looking at the world. My job is not to focus on success. My job is not to focus on making trouble go, go away. My focus is on, make, on finding trouble wherever I look. I almost said making trouble by accident. <laughs> My f- <laughs> yeah, but some people funny view us as making trouble, unfortunately. Well, absolutely. Some people view it as making trouble, not realizing that we're not making trouble, we're revealing the trouble that's already there. Testers yeah. don't help with that, because there's a lot of tests sometimes, because testers sometimes say, well, I, I break the product. No, you don't break the product. The product was broken when it showed up. Uh, or at least the relationship between the product and some person was broken. Yeah. So um, to wrap up, I would say a uh, great idea to envision success. Great idea. It's a good idea to periodically yourself focus on how could things go wrong. And it's a really good idea in any kind of society, any kind of social group, to have somebody in that sort of red team role saying, okay, this all looks great. Where might there be problems in it? And that is an important dimension of quality assurance. And it is the dimension that uh, a testing work and testers uh, address by this uh, 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 holding the idea, holding the faith that there could be trouble here. Let's examine what the situation is, and, and let's see if we can uh, detect uh, inconsistencies between what we're thinking, what we're believing, what we're saying, and what's actually the case. Yeah, it's it's a shame that I want to stop the recording, because I, I genuinely feel like I have a, a ton of other questions. Michael, I, I really hope we have the opportunity at some point in the future to continue to pick your brain. I, just this one conversation has been fantastic. Um, for me, and I just want to say thank you for joining. And, and I genuinely think a lot of other people will find it valuable to hear this and hopefully start to rethink some of their, this for themselves too. So thank you. I really appreciate your time. 
Well, thank you for, for that. Thank you for your uh, um, uh, accessibility, for your openness, and uh, um, for the opportunity to, uh, to do this. Please, let's do it again. I'd be delighted. Great. Well, everybody, um, Michael, uh, people can check out your blog. You mentioned that. Um, is it uh, which of the URLs or both URLs or wh- what would be the best resources for people who want to read more about what you are producing? What would, what's the best resource? Uh, well, uh, my own blog is at developsense.com, all one word. Um, and uh, the other place where we've got some of this stuff uh, uh, recapitulated, a blog that's shared between myself and James Bach, rapid-software-testing.com. And I'd also recommend having a gander at James's blog as well. Um, it is in these places where we... Um, uh, publish our observations about things in the world. Um, we offer uh, uh, classes and um, uh, uh, webinars and such in the rapid software testing methodology. That's Those opportunities are identified in all three places. Um, and uh, I might add, uh, anyone, anytime is welcome to contact me. I'm uh, Michael at developsense.com. James is James at satisfice.com. And uh, we both absolutely welcome uh, uh, questions and, and responses and feedback from uh, from anybody, really. And I was in proof of uh, proof of that with a cold LinkedIn message. So thanks again. And uh, everybody, thanks for taking the time to listen to this and hope to uh, hear from you soon. And Michael, hope that we get the chance again to talk soon. So um, thank you all. And, and don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, thank you, Michael, one last time. Thank you, Ben. It's been a pleasure.